childhood was in a very little town in the um, north coast of Cuba. It's called Caibarien. It's a fishing village. There's a, I think that for many years the, the, the main economic activity has been, you know, fishing. I grew up in little, little, small farm town. No sea, rivers, rivers and mountains. That was my childhood. It's in the center of the island, really close to the, to the coast with gas just to live. I was really happy girl. In a small town, my father was a carpenter. My uncle was a, the, the guy working in this, the store in another store, another family, and it was, everybody was a family. Castro uh, took the government and, and in 1959, and I was born in 1960, so I was born like a 60 months uh, after he was in power already. Yes, uh, of course, during, you know, during those days, uh, there was a, a, a lot of euphoria, you know, people really liked the revolution. A lot of people liked the revolution, back in those days. Now my father, my father said that even when he was in the mountains, he, he was uh, thinking that it was not a good option for Cuba. My family is a, a revolutionary family, yeah. Uh, with love, with follow Castro, yeah. My, especially my, my father's size. They was very, very poor people before the revolution. And when the Fidel Castro is coming to the power, they give it to them the opportunity to, to, to get a better house, better job, a little bit better life. I started my degree in electric engineer. Uh, I think that I mentioned to, I always tell the people that I talk about, you know, the career that you decide to get into it. It's different than here when you finish high school, um, everything is, is government controlled, right? So they, they base the career that they give you on your GPA, right, what it's called here, or your compromise with the revolution. So there's some career that you will never uh, belong to the family that I belong. You will never uh, have in mind that you can get into it. Like, are we talking about law school or we're talking about communication? So I will never think that I could be a journalist or a lawyer. Later on enrolled in the economy is because my that's a that's a tradition in my family, uh, in my father my father family, and I became a, an economist. That's what I my diploma was in in the beginning. I didn't like it either. I never have worked as an economist. When years passed, um, Castro uh, said that uh, the the journalists were not prepared to understand uh, uh, some index. You know, talking about economy and that he needs 300 economists in the whole country would prefer, you know, communication. And then I enrolled in that uh, opportunity. In the radio, I, I did sport and I did community. And that's where, when the problem started. When I started uh, writing and, you know, reports about what happened in my town in the daily, you know, issues. And then, and again, the government was saying that, that we will do that, that we, we, we should be able to transmit the, the mistake that the leaders of the community did of uh, a, you know, the political leaders or the uh, leaders in the, in, you know, in the economic fields, but it was only a, a campaign. So when we start going deep in, in different, you know, circumstances of things that happened, then we were called for the Communist Party say, but this is not what we want. But you say, no, no, it doesn't matter what we say, this is, this is prohibited. You cannot talk about this, you cannot talk about that. So that, that was only propaganda, pretty much. There was a, a musical group uh, went to my town and, and they made a show in the, in the, in the theater. And then uh, they have a song that apparently talk about Castro in the bad way. But they were artists with the big recognition. But they have uh, always answered to, you know, the Communist Party, why they did do that. But they went to the theater and a lot of uh, teenagers, you know, 
stand up and plow that and then the police cut in and put it in, the, in you know in detention so the next day i made my report about what happened in the theater and immediately was called to the police to political police said well i didn't do anything i just write down what happened last night no but the people don't know they don't need to know what happened because this is not good for i'm not saying this is good or bad i say i just as a journalist i transmit to this community what happened and the the, the political police exceed their you know uh power with these kids and that was the uh, at the moment that i knew i, I would be in, in a big trouble and then after that i still working but every every two three days i was called for my boss in the department gas they don't want you to publish this they, they, oh, oh god you were talking live and you you say this and yes i did well they say that and the problem start and getting very very complicated until i got fired because they just don't like anyone that can be out of their limits Actually, he start very early in a in a in a in different organization, and I didn't know. <laughs> it was a I discovered one organization. It was like a syndicate or something like that. After years, Mary, I find a, a little thing. I say, "What is that?" In my clothes, and he say, he "Say, oh, you don't have to know." I say, "I have to know. What is that?" He got like emblem or something like that for the syndicate. He start already because God's always looking for freedom and. He believed a lot in different changes. Our expectation was big in the beginning. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet the, the big leaders of the independent journalists in, in Cuba and in Havana. It was uh, the first uh, you know, spot of the independent, independent journalism. And um, we thought in the beginning that uh, um, we could do it, that, that, that maybe in the future we will have a, a space, right? And um, I think that the government led us to work like for a couple of years, uh, not in my case. I think that when we created like a month after that, I was put in, 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 the, in the prison. I think it was in, we started like in June, I remember, or May 1992, like in August, they got me to the police, you know, uh, detention in, in the capital of the state uh, but most of them of the people in Havana they could work like a four three four years on the I would say the very hard environment but you know like a more flexible Havana is a big city and I think my mistake was thinking that in a little time when I'm from I would have the same opportunity but it, it wasn't the little town more control uh, but even though we um, we start making uh, a big network, so I, I wrote down uh, for magazines out of uh, out of Cuba and Puerto Rico and Argentina. I was I was in shock when he started to independent journalism because I knew that the problem is coming a lot to our family. I got a police, uh, political police in my house many times for, for check around for things. And Ignacio was a, a very small child. He started to buy nails and for nervous. And, and I was scared many times for about that situation. And I was scared in a school for Nestor. Nestor was a, a really nice boy in the school and never got any opportunity to get any diploma or, or some um, like recognized for for best student because the teacher tell me Nestor is my best but I can give it to him the the diploma because because you guys and I start to say oh my God Nestor gonna be screwed in this country too because his father and I start worry about it that situation really about Nestor growing there.
we try to invade the process of the government when the candidates are elected. So I remember that I was very immersed in that uh, project that was create a, a, a new circumstances in, in, the, in the process where the neighbors could be coming with different names that now represent only the government, people that represent the opposition. And it will try to, to revert the process that they lead. And, 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 and uh, um, at least if not in the first try or the second or the tenth, but make an attempt to elect people that really represent the community. And, and they knew that, and they knew that, that we were working on that. Uh, and I still writing news and stuff, and um, they were accumulating evidence. So one day, uh, Castro talked, Fidel, uh, in one of his long, you know, speech, and, and, and he, and he said that he, he would be able already, you know, to mention who are the enemies of the country, of the revolution. Then when he mentioned my name, we just got shocked. I didn't, I did, I did not consider myself enemy of the revolution or enemy of Castro. I was enemy of the situation of the lies or, um, but not enemy of anybody. But he not even called enemies, so he called us a terrorist, which is just, in our days would be very bad, very bad, you know, uh, nickname, and um, and it was it was it was based not only in, in because I was a journalist, it was because I was working in that project, you know, to to use their their own system and revert that. His brother came to America in '94 when a big immigration in Cuba to here, and was the second immigration. The, the bigger one was in the '80 and the second one was in around 94. And his brother coming to here, and, and he already go there and visit us, and I still realized the life here was better. And in some point I said, whoa, I'm curious. I, I want to some point be there, but it wasn't my priority because my family, uh, I knew and live there, and we are really small family now, only my sister and me and my old, parents, my, my dad is a hundred years right now. So uh, it was hard for me to live there and, and turn my back. I told my wife, no, I'm not leaving because I don't think that he's gonna do anything, you know. I, uh, we have a, a big influence of what happened in Soviet Union and then you know, the other country where the socialism or communist was uh, established and, and uh, we thought that we, Cuba is not going to be different, right? Here, he, he can say whatever he wants, but I, I don't think that he would do anything. And I remember that my wife said, and my cousin, who's passed away already, said, Gus, it's, it's not, this is not, this is different. He's going to put all you in jail. I say, oh, no, he's not. I say, well, back and forward, Neto had two or three years or five years, and and uh, and she said, no, we, we have to leave. We, yeah, we... We left. Yeah. So as so as any any child, I guess parents shelter you to a certain extent, um, and, and there there were things going on that I had no idea of. There were things going on that I'm still finding out. I was like, what the hell? You wrote a you wrote a paper, a new Declaration of Independence of Cuba. I helped her sign it, write it, and I didn't know that at the time. But I did know that we were leaving. I did know that I had to keep it a secret. So I, at the age of six or seven, I knew that that my dad was a terrorist, quote unquote. I didn't know what the terrorist meant, but I knew that people didn't like him, and I knew that we had to leave the country. Um, I know. I remember they told me, I want to say, around f January of, I guess if, if my time is correct, like '99. Um, and for about six months, I had to, I had to keep it a secret, you know, at school, everywhere. And year after that, he put in jail all my colleagues and all my friends, and we process for them with a lot of evidence and 13 years, 15 years, 25 years in jail. Still, some of them in jail yet. We took a plane from Havana to Cancun, 
it was an old like Russian plane. I remember the seats uh, were like wooden benches, and you had to sit on the side of the planes. And this thing was like, I mean, it, it it felt like a like an earthquake the whole time. Um, and somehow we made it to Cancun, and then in Cancun we took a like a Boeing seven thirty seven. I mean something huge, a beautiful you know American Airlines airplane to Miami, which was like a twenty minute ride. Cancun Miami wasn't very long for that plane. Uh, and I remember right when we touched down, I puked. I puked all over my dad's only suit that he brought his only pair of clothes that he brought to America. Um, not, not to say he was never angry. He was just kind of like, you know, he was worried about me, I guess, as, as, as their kid. Uh, but I remember, you know, arriving to Miami International, which now nowadays, you know, being in the military and all that stuff, I, I, I'm, on, I'm at a different airport every, every year. I've seen almost every airport in America. But I remember at that time, Miami International was this, it was like, a, I've never seen it. All, only things that you could dream of. Um, and then we, we, we were picked up and taken to... Uh, Marathon Key, Florida, which is where we where my uncle lived at the time. I remember the first trip we went to Kmart. It was a store. I've never seen a store before. I didn't know. We didn't know. There was no concept of money, really. Uh, for, for me, I guess, there was no concept of, 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 of material goods handling. And um, she took us there. And, and then I had pizza for the first time that first that day. Um, I remember, like, I had ice cream, pizza, uh, all the, like, hamburgers, all those things for the first time at the age of, like, you know, seven, eight. And it was all very overwhelming. Better life, like um, economical or material things, things you never see. You, you, you happy because I was younger and my my son was happy with too many things he didn't know exist in the in the world, like a, a simple chocolate bar or a simple toy. I didn't know any English, so I remember the first couple memories too, the first homework assignments because I went right to dove right into school because I came here in June and in August class started, so we wrote, dove right into uh, I believe it was a first grade, second grade. Um, and I remember reading, I had a Spanish English dictionary and I had to translate every single word in my assignments. Uh, that's the beginning in the, in the Burger King. And I started uh, cleaning a hotel, uh, around for a couple months after that I moved to Kmart and I worked upon the men's department. I was really comfy there. It was the job, I was styling joy because um, I was promoted to, to be supervised there. And, and God said, we have to get out of here because we need to better place for race next door. And, I'm, and it was my first shock because, uh, wow, I got promotion now to be a supervisor and we have to move it again. And, so, okay, I understood because no college and nothing in the, in the key, you know, key is more for tourist people, for, it's no play for race kids, really. And we moved to, to Miami, and uh, in Miami, he worked in the gas station, and I worked in another gas station. That was my first uh, view for a restaurant, because I used to work in the Godfather Pizza, inside the one gas station. So we make a sandwich and pizza. I remember translating legal documents and leases and car loans and everything for my parents because they didn't know it. So whatever, whatever little I knew, I had to translate, which again, as a nine-year-old, eight-year-old kid, like you don't really know any legal talk. You're just kind of, and sometimes they're not even accurate translations because you're, you, some of those words you don't know. We rent a really small apartment, like I have this room for 550 monthly with full in mouses and roaches. And they say, whoa, I live in Cuba and I never had roaches in my house and, and now I came to America with a lot of roaches and mouses. It was critical for me and it was hard. And so we start talking about moving there and, and get another opportunity and see what, the, what is the real life in America. And that's why we, we get out of there. Well, when we start looking for place for moving, we we find his uncle in Oregon, and we start talking with him about moving with him, get out of Miami, get out for a better job, in different life. And he said, "Okay, you are welcome to Oregon." We start calling friends and we remind one here for Wayne just to work with him in the journaling. 
And so she said, yeah, I'm living in Indiana, Fort Wayne, so welcome to my house. I said, what is Indiana? <laughs> is the <it> Indian dance? <laughs> We're here because Maria Sanchez and Vanny Sanchez, actually Vanny just bartended for us yesterday. Uh, he's, uh, he's retired now, but uh, she, she was a teacher at the time at Lindley Elementary School. She used to teach uh, ESL or like the beginnings of ESL because ESL wasn't a thing until about the two, 2001, 2002. And she was, uh, her, she was, Maria Sanchez was my dad's boss at the radio station in Cuba when he had a, when he was a, I think he used to do like sports programming in Cuba. Um, when we found out we lived here in Fort Wayne, she used to live out, uh, the house she, she had was on Camelot, out on Trier Ridge, and out by Reed Road area, and it was a uh, beautiful home, you know, quiet suburban neighborhood type of thing, and it was it was a big shock because we came from Miami, came from, you know, the middle of a of, of, of little little Havana, pretty much, where people are running around, it's crazy, we lived in a one-bedroom one studio apartment, um, to this huge suburban house. I like small cities like this and not from again back I'm, I'm from a very small town in cuba uh the biggest town where i live was santa clara which is the capital of the state which is a town like for Wayne. It's, it's a city or town with the big university one of the biggest university in cuba uh, and uh like pretty much like for Wayne. and it's a side it's a perfect side what i you know like i was fell in love since my first time because he always missed the ocean, but not for me. I love river and mountain. Even for Wayne does have any pretty, pretty mountain and river, I can find the tree. I love the four seasons of the year. I love that color. And I'm enjoying seeing my first time, really. Uh, when when the people say, "Gosh, your restaurant," I always tell all the time I smile and laugh because it's not my restaurant; it is my wife's restaurant. Uh, when uh, when the crisis came in in the year two thousand nine, and she lost her, her job, and she applied. I, I remember I'm very clear. She put application like in seventy eighty places. No one called her, and she said, "Well." I had to make my own business. Say, well, you don't like business. She never liked business, and said, "Yeah, I'm gonna do my business." God, there is a, there is a, a location on a State Boulevard that is empty. So we, we were driving and you know around there and said, "What kind of business you gonna do here? Just, what you do? I don't know." Say, like, "I'm gonna do a restaurant." Say, "Are you a chef?" You, well, no. All Cubans cook good. Yeah, I know that, but okay, well. That's why I started my restaurant, because I have to do something. We was too close to lose the house and the car and everything, because just gas working, it was enough for that family. I was completely against it. I was dead set no. I was like, this is a stupid, that's a terrible idea. You know, I was a high school a sophomore. Um, I was like, this is awful. Anything I know about restaurants is that they fail, and you guys are going to fail. This is stupid. Don't do it. Um, and they were like, okay, but we're going to do it, because <laughs> there's nothing else that she, either she doesn't work at all or she tries to work and maybe this might work. We started the restaurant with, with, with nothing, with no equipment, with nothing. Just a couple of sandwiches that said, just a Cuban and ham and cheese and cheese salty and, and a bread with pork, that's it. Anything else, because we don't know nothing else. We start introducing other things day by day and uh, we don't have any money. The day when we open the restaurant, we have zero penny. We have to sell it for get money, for get more stuff for the second day. We live like this for month and month. They had no, I, no, no idea what they were doing or what they were getting into. All they do is they had a dream and they had, they had to put food on the table, they had to put me through high school, college, they had to raise another child. That's all, the, the, it was just one day at a time. And literally one day at a time. They would, they would buy the food at Kroger or down the road for the next day and then they'd sell the food and they'd keep some profit, put some away and keep doing. And I think their, their markup, uh, their profit was like 5%. I mean, something ridiculous. They, they would keep a couple bucks every day. We cut the pork manually with a knife. Uh, we didn't have a slicer. We did 
we had we had the ham and cheese not in the in the salad cooler we have like a container with ice and, and this is you know what i said this is uh it's, it's permitted and this is a logical that could happen but only when you have an event outside you know it's not for it's very rare to go to a restaurant and they're, they're the regular setting you know like that but we did it and we started studying and then doing a research online what what machinery is for this what is for that and, uh, and start updating little by little and now we don't have a, a you know a fancy restaurant with the best technology ever but now uh, the standard you know people that come to work with us they will see equipment that they know already When I used to work in another company, I, I don't need any English because I used to work with more Spanish people and my supervisor was Spanish and I don't care about the language. But when I started my restaurant, I said, wow, now it's different. And it was hard. It's very hard for me. In the beginning, I didn't answer the phone because I was scared. <laughs> and every day when he came to the food bank, he said, somebody called for order? I said, no, no. It was because I turned off the ring. Every morning when he left, I took off the ring. And before gas coming, gas is almost here. Boom, I put a ring back. And every day was the same situation. But one day I was busy and I forgot. <laughs> when gas coming, asked me again, nobody called y'all? He said, no, nobody called for order. <laughs> and gas checked it out and said, of course, the ring is off. He said, really? <laughs> the ring is off? He said, Yalita, you have to leave. I say, oh my God, I'm afraid. <laughs> And well, my first call was shaking all my body. <laughs> and I told to the people, you have to take me slow. What do you want? <laughs> Very slow. I couldn't be more proud of them. Um, they they had their little restaurant for eight years. They did well. They did. They went against all odds. You know, in 2007 or 2009 is when they opened. That was the, the dead middle of the recession. They shouldn't have made it. Um, I, the, the only thing that made it is their work ethic. I think they have an insurmountable work ethic. I don't. I still have to this day. I haven't met anybody who works harder than them.